Hi, this is Constance Towers, and welcome to TV Confidential. Ed Robertson welcoming you to TV Confidential, radio talk show about television that will commemorate the passing of Peter Tork later on in this hour. Peter Tork, the actor, musician, and composer forever known around the world as the bass player of the Monkees. Peter Tork died this past Thursday, February 21st at the age of 77. He was certainly the most versatile member of the Monkees. He played several instruments, including bass guitar, banjo, harpsichord, and keyboards, including the iconic piano introduction of Daydream Believer. Peter Tork also wrote for Pete's sake the anthem that became the closing theme of the Monkees TV series during the show's second season. You might recall that we paid tribute to Peter Tork, Michael Desmith, Mickey Dolenz, and Davy Jones last year, along with our friend Chuck Carter. Chuck not only wrote the Disney Channel documentary, Hey, Hey, We're the Monkeys, he interviewed Mike, Peter, Davy, Mickey, and just about every other key person behind the scenes of the Monkeys phenomenon. We will replay our tribute to the Monkeys later on in this hour. Be able to stay tuned for that. In the meantime, Tony Figueroa and Donna Allen are with us as they bring us this week in TV history. Tony's segment, as always, is brought to us by our friends at Story Salon, Southern California's longest-running, regularly performing live storytelling ensemble. For more information, storysalon.com, facebook.com, forward slash Story Salon. What do you have for us tonight? All right, so we have March 6, 1942. Ben Murphy is born in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Ben Murphy and I have the same birthday. You guys have the same birthday? Well, well, not, not, well not, not the exact no, same No, 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 no. I, I, I think he's got like 20 plus years That's on right. you. Yes. Yes. So March, but he wears it well. He wears it well. Yes, a, he he's does. A good, he's a he, good looking man. He, he has aged Always very has been. That's right. gracefully. Yes, he has. Now, of course, when we mention Ben Murphy, he is always going to be best known. With Peter Duell. With Peter Duell and Roger Davis. Let's and Roger, be fair. That's right. Let's be fair. Roger Davis, I think, gets maligned unfairly. Yeah, but but it, it, again, in fact, um, I was talking about this with a He's colleague. He's the Deborah Norville of the TV Western. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, you, you have uh, in fact Ben Murphy, I believe, said this on one of the do- I guess I think it was a BBC documentary because Alias Smith and Jones, Jones is still huge overseas, especially in the UK, and uh, the BBC did a documentary where I believe the exact quote uh, Ben said was as much as he loved Pete when he when he when he took his life uh it, it basically killed his career because yeah, yeah mm-hmm. it uh the the, the it the, the the show the show was doing you know fairly well in 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 the ratings but uh and 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 again we talked about how the uh you know the the, the, the I guess the insensitive way in which that I mean the very cold very business like way in which the network insisted that the show must go on yeah. but uh um, How long was it between Pete's suicide and the show three resuming? Days. Three, oh. days. three days. He took his, uh He took his life, and on, it was a holiday weekend. Right? I know it was. <laughs> he, he t- um, uh, they filmed December thirtieth, which was a Thursday. Uh, Pete took his life that night and died early Friday morning, New Year's Eve. Um, the studio was informed, Roy Huggins was informed, and then New Year's Day was Saturday. In the meantime, I, b- I believe within a day, Roy, I mean, Roy was informed, you get another actor and you start, you, you know, you, you continue rolling Monday morning. Uh, so I believe within a day, Roy uh, contacted Roger. Roger Davis was the first guy he popped into. He was an actor that Roy had used and Roy had always liked. And it's just one of those you, you you don't really have time to think. You just do what you're told. And so with, I think within a day, uh, either Roy or um, uh, Roy's uh, you know, first lieutenant, J- uh, Joe Swirling, arranged for Roger to you know meet with wardrobe and stuff like that, like I, I, like on Saturday. And then mo- first thing Monday morning, they started rolling. So you're talking 72 hours. How did they justify the change? Um, I don't think they did. They didn't. I mean, it, and ba- basically it was like. It was like Bewitched Revisited. I mean, one day, one week you have Dick York, and then the next week you have Dick Sargent. That's it. But at least Bewitched sent Darren off on a business trip, and when he came back several <laughs> weeks later, he was a different actor. Well, that's true. That, that's true. I mean, they made an attempt at least. That's true. I mean, yeah. that, that, that's right. That's, that's right. In the, and, in, and, in the yeah. reruns, they, 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 
they showed almost all the non darren episodes that season. Yeah. Well, Dick York, I mean, we're, we're really tangenting here, but Dick York, I mean, his back was so bad that all they could do is have him leave after breakfast and you never saw him until after the you know hi honey how was your day that's right and then and those are the ones that they re-ran over the summer exactly and then they could bring in dick Sargent. but uh i what, what happened i mean they they literally um uh I, mean, I think they had about four or five episodes in the can that aired throughout january early february the first roger davis show i believe aired like like the first or second week of february i don't have i don't have the data in front of me but uh this is an odd thing um uh and 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 and, and so if, if our friend paul green is is listening he will he will correct me on this but i believe uh the final the the episode that duel was shooting at the time you know at, at the time of his death was incomplete and they 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 had enough the, it, it, it was it was not uh, practical to reshoot the show with Roger Davis. So what they did was uh, they hired Paul Freeze to loop Pete's voice in during uh, dur- during that final episode. So when you watch the show, it's very eerie. And so some of it is actual the real Pete Duel doing his running his lines, and some of it is footage of Pete Duel, but Paul Freeze looping in Peter Duell's voice. Ooh. Boy, that would never happen today. No. I don't what, think it could happen today. No, I don't uh, think the public would let it happen the, today. The only contemporary scenario I could think of was uh, the the young actor who was on Suddenly Susan with Brooke Shields, who who killed himself in okay. Las Vegas. And, and, and the network forgave them an episode, and they did one more episode exactly. where they explain what happened. And it was a very touching episode. Yeah. It was a very touching episode, and I think it, it, it handled it uh, respectfully. When Phil Hartman died, I think that was also handled, you know, the best possible way that they could do it. Yeah, but you know, yeah, television was just run a lot differently. It was back, an assembly back line 19, back then. It was very much, especially with Universal. So, um, and, and, and again, it was just a very, I mean, you know, even um, even Roy Huggins, when I talked to him about this 25 years after the fact, around 1996, he said it was just a very cold way of of doing it but at the time you know he was he was he was you know, his job was to get the show what was to keep the show running and to work on scripts for other things he didn't really have time to think it's just okay you do what you told yeah. him. and i think there's still aspects like that in the industry today yeah. because you do need to have content to put on the air and there are people who that is their focus yeah but uh, but ben, and, and going back to ben Murphy is just it's just very unfortunate because yeah, as, as as I say he was a he was a good actor um, uh, he was used a lot uh, on, 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 on on a lot of the Universal shows uh, in the well, mid sixties a name of the game mm-hmm. with Tony Franciosa and Gene Barry and Robert Stack uh, let's see uh, Griff right he, uh, with uh, with Lauren Green after Bonanza yeah. was, that was, that was was a Lauren new Green year. show uh, uh, Berengers. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Gemini Man. Gemini Cold Man. More in, recently. in fact, uh, uh, you know, very few people know this. I didn't know this until I until I stumbled onto it when I was doing the research. But uh, in the early, 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 early conceptualization of the Rockford Files, um, when when Roy was you know uh, coming up with the just he was just thinking of it in terms of a concept of a of a private eye who takes on cold cases, closed cases, because. Um, ben was fresh on his brain, and because Alias had more or less just wrapped up, Ben was one of the first people Roy thought of for the show that later on became Rockford Files. And then, of course, when um, when he hit on the idea of, of, of tailoring around James Garner that changed the ball game. Yeah, but he is he is a very talented actor. It is really a shame that that he's always going to be forever linked to that. Let's yeah. shift gears. But to it's, something. but it's not a shame that he's forever linked to me. He's forever linked to you, <laughs> yes, uh, with your birthday, and happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. Ah, let's see. Let's go to March 9th, 1959. The International Toy Fair in New York premiered Barbie. That event was followed by 50-plus years of Barbie commercials during Saturday morning cartoons. That's why I consider it part of TV history. Uh, the first Barbie commercial aired during the famous Mickey Mouse Club. Did you wow. see Did you see the item on the um, on, on, on the, on the I forget which website, but uh, uh, it was around Valentine's Day. Uh, cause they were thinking of, and this this had to be a marketing thing, uh, but they're thinking of bringing Barbie and Ken back together. Poor Barbie. 
Yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Here's the, oh, yeah, I, we, we, I, I remember we, we, I posted this on, on, I posted this on my personal Facebook page, and I may have also done it on the TV Confidential Facebook page. But uh, uh, the, you know how when you post something, you have your choice of thumbnails, and the, the, the I think the default thumbnail was the one of Ken, and he had this really bad like. <laughs> You know, George Michael like haircut and uh, George Michael from the eighties or contemporary George Michael from from the eighties and okay. uh, uh, and, like and not allowed in the city of Beverly Hills George Michael correct okay. and I believe I said you know if if uh, if they're getting back together if she's really honest honest with them Barbie you're going to have to tell Ken to do something about his hair <laughs> well I mean Barbie fans know that Ken was really just another one of Barbie's accessories <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, if we had the if we had the rim shot machine, I would play that right now. But uh, are you implying that Barbie was Ken's beard all these years? <laughs> or if I could use I that term. I didn't say that. Okay, I, that, actually, I, that's an, I wasn't going there, but that's an inter- that's an interesting concept. I mean, did Ken stand to inherit some money if he had eye candy on his arm well, or something? Could be. But uh, it's... well, actually, I think it was just the opposite. I mean, Barbie needed Ken early on. Mm-hmm. I mean, she premiered in the early fifties. Barbie could be vice president, but Ken was president of the student yeah. council. I mean, you know, Barbie was the prom queen, but of course, Barbie Ken was, was a nurse. King. Ken was, was a doctor. A doctor. Yeah. Okay. Barbie was a flight attendant or stewardess back then. Ken was the pilot. I was very happy when years later Barbie got a plane and was piloting it herself. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you've come a long way, Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think now if we wanted to make it more contemporary, it should be Cougar Barbie. Yeah, I, I actually wasn't that an SNL sketch. It could very well I, be. I, I think it was. was. It could very well be. No, something about Barbie and her commercials. I mean, you know, unless you went to a store and bought her or had her at home, you could see the possibilities on TV in little thirty-second increments of who you could be. I mean, let's face it: before Barbie, there were baby dolls, and that was it. Barbie, I think allowed a generation, a couple of generations of little girls to explore who they could be. And those commercials sold a lot of toys. Absolutely. I lived for those commercials growing up. Uh, the different marketing campaigns they had, I couldn't wait to get to the store. My father still regrets not buying stock in Mattel early on. Scooter. Bar- was that Barbie's dog? Skipper. 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 Mm-hmm. I think was in response to parents saying that Barbie was too mature for their little girls. They did not like her figure. They yeah. did not like her adult clothes. So Skipper Frantic Tootie, who was a child, Barbie's youngest sister, who was a child. A lot of my girlfriends were allowed to have the younger dolls, but were not allowed to have Barbie dolls. They were too sophisticated. Yeah, And Francie was another one. Francie was Mid. a cousin, also not as she was about... 14, so not as, I mean, he, honestly, she wasn't as developed. Uh, <laughs> but we're going back in a couple of weeks. There you go. <laughs> and, and and now there's, you know, every ethnic variety of Barbie. Yeah. But something about the commercials that just popped into my head, I remember as a kid when those commercials came on, it was girls playing with the dolls mm-hmm. in the dream mm-hmm. house, in the Malibu Jeep or whatever was happening, and now... They're animated. They look like mini Toy Story huh. commercials. I mean, she's animated. She she moves her. You don't see the little girls playing with the Barbie. You see Barbie in this fantasy Barbie world. Oh, I don't Barbie know. has her own movies, and you know that it, that air on TV. You can buy them. Barbie the Mermaid. Barbie. And I don't think you know Barbie has lost some of the appeal because I believe options for women have opened up. Didn't there used to be, wasn't there a Barbie song about 10, 15, It's a Barbie World, am I thinking of something else? Well, I, remember, I remember there was Barbie and the Rockers, yeah. and I think. No, I know, I know what you're talking about. It was, uh, I believe it was a Scandinavian rock yeah, it's group. It's a Barbie world, world in the Barbie, I am not even think Made of plastic. Yeah. It's yeah. fantastic. Plastic, yes. Kind of like this show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what else we have now. Well, what else we have? Okay, March 9th, 1976, AB premiere, ABC premiered Family, a weekly drama yes. so, about a family set in Pasadena, California. Ah, that's, a, that's a very nice place to live. Yes, yeah, a very, very nice or even, place Or to even live. south of it. But yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the family, family is the one show Aaron Spelling wished the people remembered him for. That's true. Uh, most people don't associate him with that show because it was very different. It wasn't one of the Aaron Spelling jiggle shows. Right. And at this time, we had uh, Charlie's Angels and Love Boat and uh, yeah. and Three's what, Company. Uh, Three's and Company Flying was on. High. Flying High. That's right. That was CBS. CBS. But the, the other ones you mentioned, Three's Company 
and Charlie's Angels in Love Boat were all three Jiggle shows on the Alphabet Network at the time. Yeah. I mean, you look at what ABC had, and later on you had Heart to Heart. Yeah. This was really different that it was a family drama. Yeah, and, 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 and it, was, it was fairly realistic for the time. And, oh, yeah. Um, By far. And not a primetime soap. Not, yeah. a prime, not a primetime soap at all. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it, it was a good Tuesday night show, and, and I believe um, – it won a number of it got it got it got quite a bit of critical acclaim and I believe it won a few Emmys. Yes, it did. And yeah. it um, the the thing that really stands out. I mean, you have you had a really great cast: mm-hmm. James Broderick, uh, Sada Thompson, and uh, Quinn Cummings, Chrissy McNichol. But also, I, I remember one episode. They they were the I think the first to start on a very special episode. Yes. <laughs> and then later on, or even now, everything's a very special episode. Yeah. There is nothing that distinguishes it. But there was one of their very special episodes that featured Henry Fonda, mm-hmm. talking about an A-list movie star, Hollywood royalty, and he played the grandfather who was going through senility. Yeah. And it was you know played very dramatically, and I think it may have been the first time we see that playing out in a dramatic form because i think uh having you know older folks that were a little forgetful were sure. a great vehicle in comedy mm-hmm. and we can go all the way back to it's a wonderful life and uncle billy mm-hmm. with the strings tied around his fingers and forgetting until he you know he lost all yeah. that money but i think the show had the appeal because it was so real it did yeah. touch on problems that people could relate to in a realistic way yeah unlike say eight is enough which was not a bad show but eight and eight 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 is enough could get a little saccharine on you. Oh, yeah. Easily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And at a time, I think also when it came out, you know, they were they were topping the Partridge family, the right. Brady Bunch. They had to get more in there at a time when I think uh, smaller families were much more appealing. Mm-hmm. Plus, you know, plus another difference is eight, eight is enough was an eight o'clock show, whereas uh, family was a 10 o'clock show. And you can do a lot more mature um, you know, subject yeah. matters for shows. I think if Eight is Enough had a later time slot, they could have covered some things. But uh, yeah, they, you know, they, yeah, I think they were pushing it with maybe a, a teenage pregnancy storyline. Yeah, that didn't happen to their family; it happened to somebody else. Exactly. So of course, anything, it would never happen in their family. Yes. No, it could not happen in their family, and I'm sure that standards and practices would have had that. But we could talk about other people That's where right. family at ten o'clock it could happen to. Although their they did deal with a fairly serious um, subject: the death of Diana. Uh, Highland five yeah. five episodes so into in. the show because they had to they had to but they did but 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 they did it in a you know in a in a in a fairly uh, but going going back to what, what we talked about before um, they did a you know, the difference between doing television they it. there wasn't a new person playing the role right I mean they there was a bit of a transition to honor the memory of Diana Highland and her fans and then they gradually you know they. Gradually, they brought in the Betty Buckley character. Yeah. Who I liked. She was she, oh, yeah. a very talented actress. And, I mean, they, they handled it, I think, in, in, in the right way. Child of Television, not blogspot.com. Child of Television, not blogspot.com. Also, storysalon.com or facebook.com forward slash storysalon. Donald's new book, by the way, is called Fall Again Beginning. It's a romantic novel that asks the question, what would you do if you met the perfect person, only it was not the perfect time? For more information, go to Fall Again Series. Dot com. Chuck Harder will join us as we replay our tribute to the monkeys next on TV Confidential. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying our podcast. If you're listening to us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TV Confidential, be sure to hit the subscribe button. Ed Robertson, along with Tony Figaro and Donna Allen from Story Salon, Southern California's longest running, regularly performing live storytelling ensemble, which I understand is at a new location. Yeah, we're very excited about it. We're moving, actually, to the Party Art Studio on Laurel Canyon Boulevard, 5302 Laurel Canyon. It's a new art gallery, and it's, it's beautiful. Been, it's beautiful. Donna and I have been involved with Story Salon for the last nine-plus years. We're going to be in an art gallery now. We're going to have a $5 cover, some nice refreshments, and a wonderful, eclectic evening of storytelling. Which is a great environment because, it, 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 as you say, the word is eclectic, and for $5, it's a great evening of entertainment. You can't ask for much more. No, not at all. And uh, these stories, some of them are funny, some of them are tragic, some of them are a little off the wall. But we just have a wonderful time uh, keeping the art of storytelling alive. And you can find out more about it by going to storysalon.com. Accredited by Guinness World Records, welcome to Archival Television Audio Incorporated. A 
Peerless TV Soundtrack Archive, preserving the audio from television's first three decades, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the golden and silver age of television. For more information, go to atvaudio.com. One more item, if you're planning a trip to Los Angeles between now and March 17th, and happen to be a fan of the Batman TV series, be sure to stop by the world-famous Hollywood Museum, 1660 North Highland Avenue at Hollywood Boulevard in the Max Factor building. They have just unveiled a Batastic new exhibit called Holy Hollywood History, Batman 66, featuring original costumes and props from the classic TV series, many of which have not been seen since its original ABC broadcast from the original George Barris Batmobile to life-size sculptures of Adam West, Burt Ward, Yvonne Craig, and all three actresses who played the Catwoman and a host of never-before-displayed lunchboxes, action figures, drinking cups, board games, and other collectibles. There really is something for everyone. The Hollywood Museum is located at 1660 North Highland Avenue at Hollywood Boulevard, in the Max Factor building. Holy Hollywood history, Batman 66, is on display through March 17th. For tickets and more information, call 323-464-7776, 323-464-7776, or go to thehollywoodmuseum.com, thehollywoodmuseum.com.